Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Each year, thousands of hobbyists stop by right here just to get fish from Aquarium Co-op. With hundreds of tanks and thousands of fish and products to choose from, we have everything an aquarist need to start up their own tank. Today, with the help of our wonderful staff, we'll fill you in on the top centerpiece, oddball, and community fish that we have in our store. Let's dive in. Hey guys, my name is Zach. You probably haven't seen me here before, but uh, you might be seeing me a little bit more in the future. But today I'm here to talk about community fish. What is a community fish, you might be asking yourself. Well, this is a great example here. It's fish that are kind of going to be, you know, cruising in bigger communities of shoaling, schooling, so anywhere, you know, maybe six plus of them in a tank at a time. We have a lot of examples here, and actually one of my favorites I'm going to talk about right now is in this tank here. It's the Diamond Tetra. So it's this little guy that's kind of cruising around over here with these really nice reflective scales. You see a good group of maybe like 15 to 20 in there. Um, what you see there is about full size. They're pretty fun little guys. They're generally really peaceful. They pop very well against a very nice planted aquarium. So when you start with these little guys, like you can kind of see this guy, not so shiny, but as they get bigger, they start to look a lot better. So kind of a fun one to watch grow in your tank. And we're here at the next tank that I wanted to talk about. Um, we've got something maybe a little bit bigger than your Diamond Tetris here. We have the Mustache Danio. You can kind of tell they have a sweet little mustache on them. It rolls right down their little chin. That's kind of where they get the name, obviously. The males will have extra barbels, and that's generally how you kind of sex them, which is kind of fun. So you'll see dudes with a couple extra whiskers in there. Um, some of these bigger ones you see in here, you're going to see full size there, so they're not going to get much bigger than that. They're a lot of fun for a, a little bit bigger, maybe even a potentially more aggressive fish tank. Do great in really heavy flow. You'll get a lot of the schooling action out of them when you go in and give them a nice big power head or maybe even a couple in your tank. Um, I would recommend, you know, a little bit of a bigger tank for these guys. You know, 40 breeder, maybe bigger than that. 55 would probably be ideal, but something where they get a nice, nice little uh, run of swimming room do pretty well with nice plants, but you want to just leave a lot of space for them to swim in. So here we are at what I would consider a sweet little um, nano fish for a community tank. We have the red neon rainbows. They're also in there with some sweet little guys, the CPDs or the celestial pearl danios. I'm a huge fan of these little dudes. They get this crazy beady little blue eye on them. They get like what uh, Rob likes to call little pom-poms on the top of them. The boys get these nice little red little colorations on the top of their uh, doors or pectoral fins there. They do great in little groups, you know, sometimes I like to get them in groups of like 10 or more if you have the space. You don't need much space for them too, which is awesome. Like a little 10 gallon with a lot of plants in it. You do a great little school of these guys. You may not even need a centerpiece fish for that one just because of how much color you get out of these guys. So pretty sweet. They don't get too much bigger than what you see here. They stay under, you know, I'd say under that three centimeter range. They generally do good in like a little bit, you know, cooler tanks too. If you wanted to be in that lower 70s range, they do good there. Um, outside of that, man, just a very community friendly, nice fish, can do well with a lot of things. I know quite a few customers do like to breed these little guys. They honestly are just nice little egg scatterers. You'll see them kind of rolling into the bushes, uh, trying to get the little eggs. The boys will chase the ladies in and it's a lot of fun to watch that kind of stuff. So, all right guys, and here we are at one of the more active tanks. Um, I know I was talking about mustache and is very active. Here's a little bit of a smaller version of a very active fish. Here we have the Odessa bar. These guys are really awesome. The males get an amazing band of red down the side of them. The ladies kind of get it too, but not nearly as prominently. And then they get really dark whining in between the scales. So honestly, when they hit that three inch mark, which is about full size, they normally a little less than that, but about three inches, they get really beautiful. One of my favorite parts of these guys is when I take a little bit of like Viber bites or something real nice and uh, pellety and uh, attractive to them. Bloodworms are another great one. They go a little crazy. So a lot of the fish I like um, and prefer in my community tanks generally are a little bit food crazy. I keep a little bit bigger tanks at home. So a lot of stuff like this really gets me going. It's what makes this hobby fun for me is kind of seeing a very active response to me feeding them. Kind of like a ode to the chef, if you will. It's kind of nice, I appreciate it. Speaking of feeding, can you feed the mustache down? Oh, heck yeah. Why I didn't do this before, I'll never know. These guys are even crazier. That's the kind of action you see at a lot of the fish tanks in my house. <laughs> Crazy little ones. And we are here with my last choice, what we've got called the Orange Fin Hillstream Trout, or also known as maybe the Borrelius Ardens by the technical term. They've been in the hobby a very long time. These guys are really young here, so they'll get about four inches. They're gonna love that river environment, lots of wood, really heavy flow. 
Um, they can do a little bit cooler tank temps. They can easily go up into the, you know, like high 70s, just like most of the fish in the shop. But they also get a pretty good feeding response. I will say they look a little pudgy right now, so they may not be as interested as hoped. But we have a little more Viber Bites here today. These guys are like, oh, got a lot of blood worms in me. Uh-oh. We've got underperformance. Nope, they found it. So even though they're a little bit full even now, probably didn't need too much, but you can see they get pretty intense with their feeding. Once again, you'll see a lot of that at my house. So um, I think that my favorite part about these guys is when you first turn your lights on in the morning, you, I think that's gonna be our male right there in the middle. You can kind of see under his belly, it's a little yellow, kind of orangish. In the mornings when you first turn the lights on, that belly gets super orange on the males. And it's really beautiful when you get those lights just turned on and everybody just starts flowing in the tank. You see a lot of cool behavior. You can even, uh, hurt, I've heard of getting these guys to breed in the home aquariums too. A little bit tougher, but they're really funny if you got a nice densely planted aquarium and it's mostly just them with a heavy flow. You'll see these guys shaking about in the bottom of your substrate. They're actually burying eggs down there. It looks really intense, but it's a lot of fun. Sweet fish. Hi again guys, uh, this is Brandon here at Aquarium Co-op. Today I'm talking about oddball fish. I would consider oddball fish to be fish that you don't see too often. They're either very unique in nature or they're just plain hard for us to find and kind of uh, source. There's nothing more odd other than, you know, big giant mabu puffer. You know, puffers in general are pretty oddballs, uh, but he's definitely one of the more odd ones. So we're back at the Cherry Barb Tank uh, to talk about one of my favorite oddball fish, which are the Empire Gudgeons. These fish are kind of goby in nature. Uh, you can see a couple of them in there are, are starting to color up. I just moved them out on the floor yesterday. I believe when I was doing my research initially on these guys, they're actually the vertebrate with the smallest eggs, uh, which is pretty incredible. Uh, they get about like three to four inches, get some really stunning color on them, lots of reds and whites, especially when they go into nuptial mode or like mating mode. A great little community kind of fish for, you know, 29 gallon, great oddball. Whenever I see them, I try to bring them in because they're really cool. Hey guys, so we're over uh, here in the blue wall uh, where we keep our frogs, these blonde or leucistic frogs, meaning that they're void of pigment or, or mostly void of pigment, and they have blue eyes. Uh, here at the shop, we recommend that you feed them bloodworms, brine shrimp. They like those meteor foods. They're very peaceful. I would say use caution mixing them with any of your smaller shrimp species like your neocaridinas. They'll come up for air once in a while, which is always fun to watch. Uh, and these frogs are fully aquatic, so they don't need any kind of land or anything like that, which uh, you know a lot of people kind of worry about that. But they're totally at home in the water. All right, we're on to the next aquarium. Uh, and here I wanted to bring you guys over to talk about the Enlikiri and the Shiri uh, Bashir. I like to think of them as like kind of a hybrid between a reptile and a fish. They, they are true fish. When they're young, they get kind of gills like like axolotls have, these external gills, and then they kind of disappear as they get older. Pure carnivores, pretty sizable, you know, I'd say easily the size of your arm. They're kind of wet pets as we call them, kind of like Murphy, where they'll get to know you as the person who brings food. Uh, they get along well with each other too. They'll kind of form these like cuddle puddles as we call it. Just a great kind of oddball, reptilian-like fish. Uh, great for bigger tanks. Here we're gonna talk about the African butterfly fish, which there's kind of one hiding up there in the floating plants. These guys, I like to think of them as a pocket-sized arowana. Robert said that before, um, and it's true. You know, a lot of people think the fish is upside down, but the, the fish is right side up. Uh, they have these like almost wing-like fins to them, uh, great for jumping out and catching prey. They look really cool when viewed from above. They almost look like a moth. Here at the shop, we like to feed them freeze-dried foods like krill because the krill, uh, when it's freeze-dried, floats and it's a uh, great kind of break it up into chunks. Mine at home in the past, I've fed them uh, crickets before, uh, which is a fun treat. It's fun to watch them. The great top going oddball fish. Hi, I'm Zenzo with Aquarium Co-op. Running an aquarium filter that is air-driven is one of the simplest and most economical ways of filtering your aquarium. This is why most fish stores, breeders, fish farms, wholesalers, and fish rooms like this one use sponge filters. Sponge filters offer reliability and hassle-free operation with no moving parts. All you need is an air supply and you've got a filter that is fully contained within your aquarium. The flow is gentle, so it is great for betta fish, shrimp, 
and baby fry as well. Sponge filters are completely reusable, don't need any replacement cartridges, and last for several years. The Aquarium Co-op sponge filter is designed using coarse foam so that it can go many weeks between cleanings. The coarse foam with a weighted base means it'll stack on the bottom of your aquarium, no more floating up after a water change or initial installation. The green plastic design helps hide algae and allows the filter to blend in with your live aquarium plants. Additionally, the Aquarium Co-op coarse sponge filter can be equipped with an air stone to increase flow levels, and it's also designed to fit the Aquarium Co-op power head. Get your Aquarium Co-op sponge filter and other supplies at AquariumCo-op.com. All right, so we're at another aquarium here, and today I'm uh, talking about the leopard bushfish. I originally chose the mudfish to talk about, which those guys are a fun kind of oddball fish. Uh, and they have almost like this proboscis that helps them eat small food stones. So they're great for smaller fish. They're hard to film. So uh, we're over here talking about the, the bushfish. Tiny right now, but they'll get, you know, fairly good size. They would do best in at least probably a 55 gallon, 75 gallon would be a little bit more primo. These guys have that incredible pattern because they're ambush predators in the wild. What they do is they tend to hang out underneath plant leaves. They have that modeled pattern to them like a leopard. So great for camouflage, great for breaking up, uh, especially if you can imagine in heavily tanned waters. Extremely predatory, so they, they like to eat meaty foods, frozen bloodworms, brine shrimp. Once they get older, you might want to do like chopped up cocktail shrimp uh, or even uh, silver sides, something like that. Plan for when they get full size. When they get full size, they'll easily nab up your tetras, your danios, most, most of them at least. Just kind of an odd one. I'd keep them with lots of plants, lots of wood as well. Um, and they'll be pretty comfortable, fun little oddballs for you. Hey there folks, my name is Jaden, back again, here to talk about centerpiece fish for your aquarium. A centerpiece fish I would classify as a fish that is generally larger than all your other inhabitants. They're kind of the, the focal point of your tank and they will kind of be the big crown jewel in your aquarium. Alrighty guys, here to talk about our first fish on the list, a Pistogramma macmasteri. These are the super redneck variation of them. Very, very similar to the cockatoides of Pisto and many others. I find though they get a little bigger bodied than most other species. Very, very obvious coloration. Even these guys who are, you know, not full grown yet, showing off their crazy colors. And they got a little bit of an attitude, but assuming you provide cover, don't put fish that they maybe shouldn't be with, like maybe other centerpiece fish, usually they're very peaceful with most other tank mates. Very, very easy fish to breed, very fun. And basically all you need is a male and a female, and it's pretty much that easy. Fish number two on the list, the Sunset Honey Grummy. Now these are one of the most peaceful centerpiece fish you could possibly put in your fish tank. I have been able to keep them fairly successfully even with the little dwarf shrimp. Now they will predate on some shrimplets. Almost never had issues with these guys in terms of aggression. The only times I've found that to be true is when you got a way too small of a tank and way too many males. But otherwise, very hardy, very peaceful, pretty much get along with almost everything except for, you know, Maybe other grommies, but generally you don't want to mix them in the same tank anyway. Uh, they're bubble nesters, so they'll kind of make a little bubble nest at the top of your tank. Very accepting of tank parameters. Yeah, certain fish might pick at their feelers, you know, something like maybe certain barbs. But very peaceful, very colorful, and very hardy fish. Love the honey grommies. Fish number three on our list, the peacock gudgeon. Now these little beauties are very, very reminiscent of you know, a pistogramma in their behavior and kind of similar spawning behavior as well. Kind of fill a similar role in your aquarium. They're a cave spawning, cave dwelling little species. Now they can have a bit of an attitude and I find they're kind of prone to jumping. Um, so be careful about that. But great coloration, especially as they mature. Very easy fish to breed as well. Uh, these are actually all locally bred individuals. Uh, came from one of our local local breeders. As long as you go, don't go with the most nano of nano fish, I find they're a great community centerpiece fish and very colorful. Number four on our list are the Curbensis African River Cichlids. Very, very hardy fish. I dare say these are toilet bowl certified hardy. It's very, very difficult to make these guys unhappy in your tank. Don't try it at home. A little bigger than a pisto. I'd say very similar in their care to those guys. They do have a bit more of an attitude, but I find as long as you provide plenty of cover, line of sight breaks, they do great in most community tanks. The difference with these compared to most cichlids too is the females are the ones that have the most color. Very beautiful, very hardy, very easy fish to care for. Great for most community tanks and very fun project fish to breed. 
The final fish on my list are the splendid killifish. They're a very cool, small little killifish from Africa. Very, very interesting coloration on them. Now the females don't have so much color compared to the boys, but the boys are gorgeous fish and they stay really small compared to most other killifish. Not as aggressive as their gardener eye counterpart, which is a little more common. They normally hang towards the top of the tank, but uh, if you don't have a lot of plants, they might hang a little lower. Their care would be reminiscent of uh, a pistogramma or other you know, soft water fish of their type. And generally, yes, killifish will eat anything that'll fit in their mouth, but compared to most other killies, they're very, very peaceful. Unique uh, centerpiece fish that you don't normally see for community tanks, but generally are a great candidate. From all of us here at Aquarium Club, thanks for coming by.